Hello and welcome. My name is Stephanie DiPetrillo. I am a senior researcher here at the Voorhees Transportation Center at Rutgers University, um, the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. And I lead the NJTOD project, which I do um, in, in a partnership with um, a partnership between Rutgers VTC and the Transit Friendly Planning Program at New Jersey Transit, led by um, Megan Massey, who's here. And as most of you know, I hope, the NJTOD is a mostly online uh, resource that focuses on the potential for development and redevelopment around New Jersey's transit facilities. And we work through discussion of best practices and local problem solving to provide information for people to advance transit-friendly places. Um, today, we continue our TOD in depth in um, your downtown forum series, which we do in collaboration with downtown New Jersey, led by uh, Courtney Mercer. Um, I want to thank our panelists. <laughs> See you again. <laughs> I want to thank our panelists and our moderator, as well as my colleagues at uh, New, Jersey uh, New Jersey Transit um, and at downtown New Jersey. And we are extremely excited to talk about our talk with our panel today on a topic that I think weighs on our minds a lot, parking. It's been a subject raised at every one of our events, and it is probably raised at every public meeting about redevelopment. I just want to start off our discussion today by offering a few thoughts. These are my thoughts, but I think they probably apply to a lot of people. Um, we know that in the TOD community, we generally understand that parking is necessary but we also understand that parking is a commodity and that it is frequently underpriced and oversupplied. And that we as planners and developers and uh, public officials and the public interested in the health of downtown transit friendly places, um, we can benefit from thinking about how to better use this asset to create transit friendly places for people. And with that, I'm going to turn the lectern over to Courtney Mercer. Thank you. Um, so you can't have one of these without a sales pitch. So th those of you who don't know downtown New Jersey, <laughs> we are a member supported uh, nonprofit education advocacy organization actually started back in 1988 when the malls were decimating downtowns. Um, now the downtowns are coming back and the malls are being decimated. Uh, so our mission has swiftly <laughs> shifted a little bit, uh, but still trying to keep up um, with what's going on. So we do a lot of programming, a lot of networking. Um, we'll go down to Trenton when need be. And then we also like to recognize our members. Um, and just uh, coming up, is our conference in Red Bank. It's a great town um, on October 19th. There are postcards out front. I highly recommend you come. It's a great networking event. We have some really good uh, programs. We're gonna talk about um, uh, think big, act small. So so little things you can do to with high impact and then big events. So we're gonna talk about the World Cup coming, um, they're supposed to be uh, the, the Rev 250 anniversary, things like that, and how downtowns can capitalize on that. And then also using big data to tell your story. So I think it's all you know good stuff uh, to learn and take back to your community. So I hope you will come. Um, and so with that, I think actually Stephanie kind of stole some of my, my not stole, we, we all collaborated. So I'm not going to repeat why we're doing this. I think we all know why we need to talk about parking. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over again, thank our speakers, and hand it over to Zoe. Let me get your thing up quick. All right. All right. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Um, and so, uh, welcome. We already had two welcomes, but I'll say it again. Welcome. Um, my name is Zoe Baldwin, and I'm the New Jersey Director for the Regional Plan Association. We're the nation's oldest research planning, metropolitan uh, research planning and advocacy organization. And uh, so we're actually 100 years old. And based off of what I believe was our first parking study, um, uh, we've been analyzing parking since the 1940s. And so even back then, our, our planners really identified that parking was not perhaps the highest best use of our urban space. And now, granted, we were like very into uh, parking uh, structures at the time um, in our downtowns, but <clears throat> um, 
the the point is that uh, being analytical and being critical of parking and the effects of the uh, these antiquated standards, to be frank, um, it's being treated as radical or somehow um, new, and it's been around for a very long time. And so our speakers are going to get into a lot of the details uh, for New Jersey and for what we're doing um, right here at home. But just to give you a scope of the problem, uh, nationally, the U.S. is estimated to have about two billion, with a B, parking spots, which is almost seven for every car. And it's unfortunately not that uncommon uh, for cities to have even 15% of their land area covered by parking. And that's, um, again, we're dedicating a huge amount of our space to storing dormant objects, right? That's what parking is. Instead of, you know, facilitating people, commerce, um, and parks, you know, everything that makes our communities thrive. And that's like really big and we have to be more uh, specific, uh, excuse me, more intentional about that and we need to be really thoughtful about how we're um, incorporating our movement into our downtowns and the effects that that has uh, on the local economies. And so even more than that though, requiring this much parking in statute is unproductive, it's unhealthy, and it's really expensive and we're going to get into that. And so while planners and developers have been kind of waving this flag for a while, um, it's only just now that these conversations in the U.S. are really starting to take off. And so it was kind of interesting. Um, I didn't actually know this until I started preparing for this event, but in 2022, 15 cities in the U.S. significantly reduced or eliminated their parking standards. And to be clear, we're not talking about the usual suspects. Uh, among this is Gainesville, Florida and Anchorage, Alaska, right? And so, uh, you know, I, I read that and I was like, should I be embarrassed or emboldened <laughs> that if towns like that can do it or cities like that can do it, uh, which are clearly more car dependent than the entire state of New Jersey, maybe we can actually get this done here at home and perhaps before the end of the year. And so that's why it's so exciting to kick off this conversation today. Um, it's really timely and I'm going to have an ask of you all at the end of my little portion here. But so just to let everyone know, uh, in May, legislation to reduce parking minimums around transit stations in the RSIS uh, passed the Senate. And by the skin of its teeth, by the way, 21 votes, the exact number it needed to pass, which is um, frustrating because this should be common sense at this point. And so uh, the bill number is S3605, um, and it's sponsored by Senators Sarlo and Singleton. And they did a great job of making sure we got it through one house. And so now we need to get it through the second house. And, you know, I think it's no secret in this room that we're one of the most transit dense states in the nation. And we have very ambitious greenhouse gas uh, goals and rules that are going to necessitate transit uh, used to, to achieve them. But the key to maximizing the, the transit assets that we have is actually in our land use. And so um, having this legislation, it, it's not a panacea, and we'll get into the details, but it does start to tackle this core issue by at least IDing this is a huge problem around our transit assets. And we need to be more honest about what the needs are of the broader community. And so um, uh, our fantastic summer intern, Sophia uh, Pereira back there, um, decided to map this out for us. And so this is kind of the zoomed out view, um, as you can see, I'm sorry, to find my map here. Um, and this is also on our, okay, sorry, I'm not used to them. Uh, this is also on our website. Um, so you can uh, get an idea, you can play around with it. And so um, the way that the bill is structured a municipality would qualify under this bill if it has any train station or light rail station or five or more bus lane, uh, lines, 15 or more bus stops on one street or ferry terminals. And there's a lot of questions probably wrapped up in there. It's not a standard rubric, and I think there's a whole other conversation about ferries that you could have. Um, but around these assets, uh, parking minimums would be reduced by 50% within a quarter mile, 30% between a quarter mile and a half mile, or 20% between a half mile and a mile. And so when you're looking at this map, um, so I just wanted to pick an area here, we kind of had all the modes. So orange is light rail, green or ferry, purple is bus, and uh, blue is train. And so um, 
you can see that it's kind of obvious. You know, there's some usual suspects. We expect probably a lot of this, the communities uh, relevant would be up here. But then actually gets interesting. You have more down south than you'd think, keeping in mind that a huge swath of this is like the Pinelands and there's not really much going on there, right? Um, but when you get down into South Jersey here, the bus really makes up um, a meaningful part of the communities that we would be looking at this um, to attack. And so um, this is a first step in the right direction. And so again, this passed the Senate by the exact number of votes. And according to staff, that was really hard to get and took a lot of arm twisting. So there is a lot of interest uh, in the legislature and in staff in actually advancing this bill through the assembly. So I do, here's my ask. Um, if you could reach out to our assembly speaker or our assembly majority leader, it's either ASM Coughlin, C-O-U-G-H-L-I-N at njledge.org or ASM Greenwald at njledge.org, um, L-E-G, njleg.org, um, and ask that we advance this bill because we need to be showing that there is support for this because what happens when these bills pass is the League of Municipalities comes out and they're like, we couldn't possibly handle this. It's going to be terrible. We need as many parking spaces as possible. And they're not actually representing the views of all of these communities represented here. And so we need to make sure that our legislators know there is support for this. And so um, that, that's my one main ask right there. And so um, to talk a little bit more uh, about the broader context and the details, I'm going to uh, pass it over to our panelists who all bring a wealth of information and knowledge to this table and from uh, different angles. And then um, uh, if you're going to save your questions for the end, we'll do a little Q&A at the end. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Deb Tam. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Deb Tantliff, I wear a few hats. I will try to stay within one or two of them today. Uh, my day job is I'm a multifamily and mixed use uh, developer. I focus on a lot of downtown mixed use, transit oriented development, uh, and I focus throughout the state of New Jersey. Um, I actually worked with Jim in his former life at New Jersey Transit. We developed the uh, first New Jersey Transit, Transit Village in Morristown uh, in 2010. Um, one of my other hats is I'm the vice chair of the New Jersey Builders Association, representing the entire shelter industry throughout the state, um, and uh, also a downtown New Jersey board member, and I thank Courtney, uh, Courtney for scheduling this forum around the real hat that I'm wearing today, which <laughs> is the um, executive committee member for the Center of Real Estate at Rutgers. Um, and we just released a white paper on actual parking usage in multifamily communities. Um, and so the, all the things you're going to hear about today from all of us, nothing groundbreaking, nothing earth shattering, nothing that we woke up in the middle of the night with some aha vision. Like these are just very logical, rational conversations that are now starting to become more widely acceptable national issues. Um, as part of the advocacy initiatives that groups like the Builders Association and RPA have done in trying to facilitate changes in legislative policy on transit, um, there have been various discussions with groups like uh, the Site Improvement Advisory Board um, on, on changing RSIS regulations. Um, I'm a huge fan of this bill um, and the reduction at transit. I would like to see it, uh, I'm, I'm also incremental, so my step two is that we do actually wind up changing RSIS. Um, so the premise of the Rutgers uh, white paper was that we needed to obtain as much data as we could to tell the story that we all talk about, um, but that we are constantly challenged with. So we um, surveyed and were able to utilize data from about 175 properties and approximately 30,000 apartments um, that have been operating. Um, and we're able to qualify the actual usage and correlation of the usage um, based on the unit matrix um, and other qualifying factors in the community. Are you, are you transit proximate? Um, are you mixed use? Um, part of the initiative was to, again, ensure as much data and as much objectivity. Within a subsect of the surveys that we received, um, we had uh, more detailed data that actually correlated parking spaces based on unit type that we were able to add a layer of assessment to the study. 
And we also incorporated analysis of census data and car ownership in relation to census statistics. And what we found is nothing earth shattering, nothing we didn't know, but now the math, the, the, the information conveys it. Um, on average, across the board, the average parking ratio on a, on a gross level number of units to number of parking is less than 1.2. Um, and if you look at the uh, average of the three um, data sets that we studied, the larger survey sample, the census samples, and the more uh, detailed samples from within the survey, we utilized the average of, of the parking ratios and were able to propose new parking ratios based on individual unit type. And so what we found is that we believe that the blended average, um, which RSIS blends really at 1.9 based on your one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom counts, the proposed average would be about 1.4. And so what that means is we are building half a parking space too much per unit. And so when you start to really look at master plan initiatives and redevelopment plan guidelines, take an average 100, 100 unit project, 150 unit project, 70 unit project, you could be building 75, 100 parking spaces too much. And what part of the data of the study show, correlates the cost of the parking and what it costs to build that parking and puts it in context of the viability of projects, right? The ability to move a project forward is predicated on project returns, which has to be a certain threshold to obtain the necessary financing. And so what that means is the cost of delivering that product gets absorbed by the end user. And so when you factor in the cost per unit that you are spending to build that extra parking and you look at average rents across the board, there's probably about 4% of value in rents that are correlated to just the delta of excess parking that we are building. And so if we just on face value said we can build less parking, for the same projects, housing naturally would become more affordable because it would allow the base rent to drop by about 4%. And so layering in other environmental considerations um, and, and the impacts of structured parking, asphalt, concrete, right? Layering in the realities of trends and ridership today and the fact that Uber and Lyft and rideshare programs are prevalent and that municipalities have their own rideshare programs as well, we really have to think both quantitatively about what the data is showing us and practically going, okay, we live in a post-COVID world where people work differently. Towns are being redeveloped differently because every town now is focused on downtown mixed-use walkable communities. And people are naturally driving less. There are less driver licenses being issued, so why are we still using regulations from 1776, right? Um, so with all that, you know, the, re you know, the rest of this conversation um, is really going to, I think, speak to creative ways that logic has already prevailed on successful projects and ways that we should be thinking about planning and, and, and governing going forward to address the underlying realities that we already know, um, but now there's a concerted effort that's willing to address them at a regional level and a municipal level. And with that, I'll stop. <laughs> that's excellent, thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Zullo. Uh, I'm the president of THA Consulting. Uh, we are kind of a consulting firm on the dark side. We make most of our money off of uh, designing and uh, engineering parking facilities, structured parking facilities. Uh, I was a former uh, director of the New Brunswick Parking Authority and a former uh, director of real estate at NJ Transit. So, been around parking and, and, and interacting with parking for quite a long time. And I'm a, and I'm a Blaustein grad, and I think one of the early books I read, Edge City, if you ever read it, says, Parking is the pivot of urbanity. Always has, always will be. But, uh, um, so it's a really excellent discussion. And <clears throat> a lot of, you know, we work with a lot of developers. And the key, you know, jet, you know, parking is very expensive. Structured parking is probably, you know, given a lot of factors, uh, but easily over $30,000 of space for an efficient standalone facility. Uh, as Dev indicated, you know, you have, 
You do the debt service on that, the operating costs, they gotta be maintained for years to come. Uh, you're easily talking, you know, per space at about 200 to $250 uh, per space per, per month that you have to get to cover those expenses. So you can see, you know, the impact on a pro forma or rent and that type of thing. <coughs> So, you know, we do a lot of uh, both municipal parking studies and so a couple key points that I'll make before I, uh, uh, you know, kind of hand over, but we, our job is to really help right size parking. And, you know, a lot of the great data that their study uh, revealed is we do a lot of the same thing on Collins here and uh, we've worked in Westfield, we've worked in Metuchen, and, and it's really about and each, each community is really unique because, you know, just take transit. You know, you know the, the commuting time from Westfield or from Newark or from New Brunswick or from Somerville is very different. And that level of service can impact parking demand. So when we go into a, do a study area for a place, we'll look at that. We, you know, and ideally what we do is we really go out and count cars. If we have to really understand what the parking demand is, we'll go into residential buildings at night and say, you know, you got 100 units, you got 100, how, much, how many people are actually parking? And we're doing this not just for trains or train oriented towns. There's a Hamilton Street here in Franklin Township, if you're familiar with it, has seen in the last 10 years hundreds of units of multifamily where before it was really two levels. And we've done a lot of studies there to try to help them right size their parking and a couple strategies to do that beyond you know counting cars is one we talk about sharing parking um, you know we always look for a complementary use in these mixed use projects retail office residential and how you don't you don't look at these independently but how they can share and talking about New Jersey Transit um, you know obviously they do need commuter parking you know not everybody lives within a walkable distance to a train station. And if we need to get more and more of our population riding mass transit, they're likely gonna to have to drive from somewhere. So just take commuter parking with a residential building. Great mixed use. You don't have to build 100 units, 100 spaces for a commuter and 100 spaces for residential. It's 200, maybe you can do 150. And that's the key to you know, really trying to right size the other thing is maximizing, you know, existing assets within a town. If you go into a lot of uh, downtown environments, and I think we were just talking about merchants, everybody says we have a parking problem, but you know, if it, they have a parking problem right in front of their store because there may not be a space open, and there's a lot of parking management strategies you can do to turn that space over, to try to push employees a little further away, you know, provides available parking so it's and you can look for other assets that may exist at churches and underutilized facilities and this so before you go vertical with the structure it really is key for a depth to look at what other assets can be utilized how their operations can be maximized to accomplish this then if you, you know then if you do have to do and what other you know in addition to you know mass transit <clears throat> we've done a lot of work in Westfield with them. And, you know, but what other micro mobility assets are available? So, you know, if people do live a mile from the station, you know, what can they do to get there? I, I, I think e bikes are going to make a big difference. You know, everybody's, they've been scooters, there's been bikes, but, you know, e bikes are really, are really uh, comfortable. They're, you know, sweat when you use them. It's, uh, so I think maybe they could have a little bit of a transition for these great towns. Deb mentioned um, um, uh, publicly funded or uh, in Summit where they did, instead of building a new garage, they subsidized Uber and Lyft rides to their station, uh, which uh, worked really successfully for them to kind of not have to build a new facility. So, um, you know, those are a couple of points that I want. And the other thing about developers, it's interesting because <clears throat> as Deb mentioned, the last thing they want to do is build parking and spend that money. But when you start, well, when you start talking about shared parking with them, you'll be surprised at how many say, "No, no, no! I, I, my, my tenant's got to have space right there, and they got to have that assignment." And we're like, "Well, you know, 
if you're going to do that, you're going to have to build more parking. And, and some of them will even say, well, if I got a market, I got to get financing, I'm going to have to have a dedicated space. And these are really, really big and savvy developers that I'm surprised because in New Brunswick here, you know, which has done a lot of urban redevelopment, the parking authority provides a you know good amount of parking and building can if the parking authority has available capacity the developer just has to go and say yeah you know we'll we'll, we'll give you 50 100 spaces whatever it needs but they're sharing that you know they're not getting a dedicated space anywhere and a lot of towns like Morristown and things like that you know that's you know the smart way of doing it and, and I think that's some of the mentality that's got to change is <clears throat> people move into the urban area or the downtown area that you don't, you're not going to get a dedicated space because as mentioned that space could be vacant you know 60 percent of the time and, and just one other thing related to covid you know with more people working from home you know you have to kind of rethink shared parking analysis like we've gone if you look at it or uli the suburban environment they'll say 50 percent of the residents are going to leave from 8 a.m to 6 p.m so you can share that parking when we look at it now, we're looking much more conservatively because a lot more people are staying at home. You know, transit ridership I think is only back to 50, 60 percent, hopefully more. But yeah, yeah. But, and we did track that. We were like, but we were talking about it, and you know, that's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Obviously, it's going to be peak times. So there's a lot of dynamics. Just to kind of wrap up a little bit of my com comments, that every every kind of town is is individual and you really have to look at some of the, the transit assets and what, what's available and you know do some due diligence to kind of make sure you're you're parking at the right amount and because what happens too if you don't and even in, in towns where you see parking minimums because we like Hartford we did a parking study in Hartford which, which was an early town to go you know no parking minimums well, what's happening is developers are building and people are inundating the streets. So now parking spaces that were designed, you know, intended to be available for downtown businesses and restaurants are having residents lock those up at five o'clock at night. And unless you're enforcing that, to try to push them to wherever they're gonna be. So that's just a consideration. I, I think parking minimum, you know, or no, no, no parking minimums are great but there's, they're gonna potentially have some impacts on the overall area if it is, you know, kind of in a downtown type of setting that they may be, you know, there's gonna be people to park, you know, and uh, so, and, and another thing, like, un, you may have heard of good parking strategies unbundling the parking costs from rent. So that means, you know, if I have a car, I should pay more, I, I, I should pay for my parking, not as part of my rent, but as a, a distinct, uh, you know, as, separation not married into the rent what happens especially with young people they go i'm not going to pay 150 dollars for parking in the garage and they said i'm going to go park on the street and move my car so these are just some of the things you have to be aware of but as, as we've talked i need to counter that point one second because <laughs> i'm having this issue in a municipality and they want part of the approval is obligating the developer to incorporate yeah. one parking space per unit as part of the lease the developer is still going to charge for that parking. Yeah. You are, the developer is going to artificially inflate the rent and charge for that parking. They are also going to wind up absorbing the parking that they would be charging the affordable units that they can no longer charge them. So it is going to artificially inflate rent because the council person does not want to tell the local constituent, okay, sorry, you lost the parking space in front of your house that you weren't using because you actually have a garage and a driveway. Right. No, but no, that's fine. And I'm an yes, advocate, for, I'm an advocate for, for unbundling parking. It just requires a higher level of enforcement yes. on the street so that you push, you know, so that you are making the parking that's supposed to be intended for commercial businesses available that Absolutely. overnight. Um, anybody can park anywhere. But I think, you know, as a kickoff point, that's what's, you know, some of my comments and look forward to answering any questions. I'll turn it over. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Hi, um, I'm Jeannie Kim. Um, I am city executive for Arcadis, um, and I can explain that. <laughs> I, I'm sort of the chief growth officer for Arcadis New York metro area, and Arcadis is a big global engineering and design firm. Um, 
I am not a resident of New Jersey, so I'm sort of the outsider here. But um, you serve. I, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm on the board of the RPA, so I've kind of got that regional um, perspective. Um, so, so I have to kind of talk about my background to you know, get into my perspective on this topic. Um, I've been a consultant for 20 years. I spent 14 years um, at a traffic and transportation company in New York City. I did a lot of parking studies. I did a lot of traffic studies. I did a lot of land use approvals that required lots of, you know, late night debates with agencies and the public about traffic and parking. And as you all know, parking is a God-given right to, <laughs> to people. I mean, to I Americans. to Americans. It is as um, American. More than it is. Um, you know, the, the battles that I witnessed and had to negotiate for the removal of, you know, two on-street parking spaces in Upper Manhattan to allow a hospital to have better emergency um, room access. <laughs> I mean, you laugh, but, you know, it became a political fear. So I want to sort of have that in the backdrop that, you know, we can be very rational, we have all the data, um, all the analysis, but really parking is an emotional issue. Um, so that's my perspective on one hand, and then I've also spent um, about six years um, in an um, advisory firm doing um, the economic development um, studies, the um, uh, supporting developers um, identify you know, feasibility of, of development, um, doing TOD projects, and my work was primarily across the country and in, in more traditionally auto-centric cities from the Hartfords to Jacksonville to Detroit. Um, and what was really interesting about those places is they really um, wanted to urbanize, to densify, to create vibrant downtowns. They saw TOD as the answer for, you know, I'm sure you're all believers, you know, the virtuous cycle of the TOD um, supporting transit through fare box revenues, um, added ridership, and then the development itself really becoming that economic driver for downtowns. Um, which also, I have to say, it's not about the D. I'm, my Canadian colleagues call it TOC, transit-oriented communities, because it's also about the public realm and the spaces that we create that you know, I think we have to think about when we think about parking as well. We can kind of get into that later. Um, <clears throat> and um, so I lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> but um, so, so that's how I see parking. And, and then I spent a year at New York City Department of Transportation where I saw more fighting about cars and, and parking. But what I noticed that well, while I was at DOT in 2021, and Jim, you referenced this COVID point, is that um, you know Americans' relationship with the car changed during COVID? In New York City, we saw a forty percent increase in auto ownership. I don't think people have quickly gotten rid of their cars. Um, I think there is sort of a different relationship that people have had to their cars. Everyone's behaviors have changed, and it's not just about work, but it's also about sort of the flexibility you've built into your lives. Um, even as we go back to transit, there's certain kind of COVID era behaviors um, and, and you know, that, that sort of we have to recognize. Um, and, and so I think all of that sort of plays into this parking debate. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think um, it's easy, but at the same time, I think, you know, we've definitely evolved. I mean, New York City, granted, I would say most development in New York City is TOD, but recently the mayor announced um, lifting um, some outdated zoning rules where you no longer have a parking minimum for new development. Um, I know it's been done in other cities, but I think to have that sort of blanket policy in a municipality as large as New York City, where it, not everything is dense as Manhattan, is a sea change. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that 
and then going back to my comment about TOCs, you know, I'd love to have a conversation later about um, sort of the innovative ways um, we can think about um, parking policy and also the financing piece. So, you know, PILOPs, I love that term, payment in lieu of parking. Um, you know, how do you think about parking at a district level? How do you have um, stakeholders pay into a parking fund, right? Where, you know, you're thinking about usage on a more district-wide level and then having those funds then pay for the public improvements that ultimately benefit the community and generate broader returns um, than at the sort of individual site level. Um, so those are my thoughts. I'm sure I'll have lots of other thoughts, but I don't want to take up too much time. Oh, no, you're good. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kristen Mitchell. I am Director of Trans-Oriented Development at New Jersey Transit. And uh, our office is in the Real Estate Division, which Jim used to head. Um, and we work very closely with our colleagues in Transit Friendly Planning, uh, with Megan Massey and her team. But our group works on uh, real estate development projects on land that New Jersey Transit either owns or has a controlling interest in. There are certain um, places in the state where we have um, rights, uh, where, where the e there's an easement that says that the, the land has to be used for parking um, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> um, so we work on projects in those um, areas where we own or control um, some aspect of the land. And um, I'm new to New Jersey Transit. I have not yet been there a year. Um, so I got a lot of intel. I, I mean, I've learned a lot in this past uh, eight months, but I've also gotten a lot. I got some intel before coming here today, and, uh, and Jim may be able to speak better to this than I. But um, historically, we have required at least a one-to-one -one, um, replacement commuter parking ratio. And that has changed, so I think that's good news for everybody in this room. We are no longer adamantly requiring a one-to-one -one parking ratio. Um, and a couple of, three instances where I know that the, the ratio did decrease as a result of our actions. It's not perfect, but it did decrease. The commuter, the number of commuter parking spaces has decreased in, um, in Somerville, in Dover, and in um, and will in decrease in Boundbrook. So those are just some examples of where we are not requiring one-to-one -one replacement. Arguably, we may still have too much in some of those locations, but we're definitely headed in the right direction. And in the future, when we put out RFPs or RFQs, we're going to be very intentional about our um, our expectations. Um, from developers with respect to instituting tr transportation demand management uh, activities, whether directly or through the end user, whether it's like a big office tenant or residential, we're, we're going to be requiring some measures of transportation demand management. We'll have like a menu of options and they can, they can choose what makes sense because we're really gonna be looking at the projects on a case-by-case -case basis. We are not gonna have like a, a formula that says it must be X or it must be Y. Um, but we do wanna be very clear with developers up front about what we are looking for and with the municipalities as well. Um, so that is our plan going forward. It is not a one-size-fits-all thing. We look at context um, in the surrounding community. But as well, we look at context of um, nearby train stations and whether they may have excess capacity to be utilized. Um, and then I mentioned a couple of our projects where the commuter parking has decreased. I also want to mention one. You might roll your eyes at this because uh, you it would expect nothing less in a, in a town like Hoboken, but we, are, uh, we expect our developer partner to break ground on a 386-unit um, apartment building in Hoboken right next to the train station and there will be no parking there um, and then there is no parking planned for um, the commercial building or the office building that is also planned for that site so um, we do think we're headed in the right direction we really appreciate having this data um, that has recently come out and we will be using that because um, you know, not everyone is 100% sold on the fact that they don't need one-to-one -one parking. 
So thank you very much. Look forward to continuing the conversation. And thanks so much for having me. All right. Thank you so much. And it's so funny. I was like taking all these notes. There's so many good <laughs> things here. I have all the things. Um, but so I wanted to touch on one thing because I think this is really important, right? And so we've all been talking about Deb and this study that came out, and it's fantastic that we have data. But um, one of my colleagues had said this so matter-of-factly, and I want you all to use it in your life because it's really important to call this out. But you get in trouble sometimes bringing facts to a feelings fight, and that's what this is. <laughs> he just said he was like, "Don't bring facts to a feelings fight," though, so, and you're like, "That's exactly what's happening, right?" And so. We're all used to analyzing um, and putting out recommendations, and so I'd love to hear from you guys a little bit about um, how do we deal? How do we deal with the psychology of this? That's an interesting hurdle that I think is less discussed uh, when it comes to parking. Um, it's a right. It's a goddamn right in the in America, right? And so that's a feeling. The data's there. We don't need it. So I'd love to hear, um, and I want to open this to uh, all of our uh, speakers. Uh, to talking a little bit about if you've had experience with that or any of your thoughts on that. So, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, you know, obviously, you know, going in front of a planning board always concerns me of going into parking discussion stop because it is so emotional and, and people are incredulous about, you know, what standard you're suggesting that could be lower than what they think is right. And, you know, I just think it really does come down to data and to study and to, um, you know, what existing um, projects are in place to inform uh, and, and locally, not, you know, they, they have to be that way. Uh, I also think, you know, contingency planning, you know, to the extent there is an opportunity for that. Um, you know, you mentioned the pilot, which is a great tool. Um, but I think, you know, if there can be, like you talk, and with Transit, you talk about the TDM management. I think if you can build a good enough story about what data reveals, what other alternatives there are for, you know, the, the, the car parking, and to, you know, if, if things change, what's the contingency? And, you know, a lot of times there isn't an opportunity for contingency, but if you're in a downtown, you know, those, those opportunities may exist. And I think, you know, the question is, you know, how, how creative and forward thinking is the municipality? You know, that they, they can either have, you know, we're working in a town right now where it's taking down literally a 500 foot length garage, which is almost an entire city block. We, we've shortened it, made it, you know, smaller based on all this data that we've we've accumulated and studied and continue to collect occupancy data. And we're saying, do a smaller garage, and then build a nice 150 unit apartment building adjacent to. And people are incredulous about how can you do that? Because three times a year when they have major festivals, that garage fills up. But every other time, that between two garages in the same area, there's 500 vacant spaces during normal business hours, during normal weekends. So it's, it's, it's having that data, but then it's also having municipal leadership to say, we are going to do this. We're not going to build for the car. We're going to build, you know, what's right and, you know, do good urban planning decisions. So that would be my story. Brief. I like that. It's storytelling because the data doesn't matter when you're in front of a planning board um, because it's emotional and the developer is coming in to change my town and, and you don't know because you don't live here. And, That's and, and, and well, <laughs> no, but, no, but it's 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 the way we speak about it, right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't think anybody really cares to talk about parking at a planning board. They want to talk about traffic. Well, if you build it, they will drive, right? <laughs> so we have to change the conversation. We have to change the terminology we're using. Um, one of the questions I got a lot when the study came out was, well, there's got to be a distinction between urban and suburban. Sure. <laughs> Define urban and suburban in New Jersey. Is, is Marstown urban or suburban? There's only one Jersey City. There's only one Newark, right? There's only one Montclair. And so it, it, the conversation is not urban-suburban. The conversation is about density because the, 
the areas that have greater population density, that's where New Jersey Transit will will service. They will not add rail line or bus line when there's no critical mass of ridership. And so the study that we issued speaks to the fact that we looked at zip codes and population and, and have to recognize that those locations have greater access to more mass transit options. And so the ratio should be further considered in those locations. But I don't think anybody in New Jersey at any planet, you know, any local constituent wants to, their town should be defined as urban or not, is Westfield. I mean, the, the, the Lord and Taylor redevelopment, building how many square feet of office at the train station, who would have thought we'd be building new office in, a, in, in suburbia? And we don't need to, be, I mean, there is a lot of parking in that site, but not as much as normally would have been built. And so I think, I think it is the way that the development community is perceived um, and, and the words that both the development community and the municipal agents use, we have to start changing the way we talk about this because I would rather argue a, 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 a more compact concept plan that creates more walkable animated streetscape and alleviate traffic as opposed to talking about how many parking spaces I'm, I'm building you. Because um, people can get on board with that conversation, right? Um, and so I, I think that's a lot about it. And I think you you alluded to that um, because it is, it is. I, I want to park in front of my house, in front of my store. I want my customers to park in front of my store. And and one thing I learned very clearly and very it was very significant. And, and it was during when we were redeveloping in Morristown, the concept of system-wide parking, it, it's... It's a pretty compelling concept. I mean, downtown Morristown, you've got several major municipal parking garages adjacent to the public open space in the middle of town, proximate to the theater, right, along all these different restaurants. So if you can't park in this garage, go park in this one half a block down the road and your walk is 45 seconds longer, you know, and that conversation doesn't happen enough. So I really think it's about the way we talk about it as opposed to only focusing on the data because data is quantified and it's tainted and it was a, you know, and, and it's not true. And there's no way it can be right. <laughs> I, think, I think, I won't talk about the getting past the planning board because that's its own issue, but um, I think because this is, a, this, we're talking about psychology now, which is behavior. Um, and so I know this is not, you know, the best analog, but, um, Way back when, I worked on the um, approvals and opening of the Barclays Arena in Brooklyn. And um, part of the EIS required that there are a certain number of you know, very um, robust TDM measures to be implemented. Um, so we had a number of measures, very aggressive measures, but we also planned and had a number of um, satellite parking lots and garages to make sure we could handle the, the overflow. What happened is people kind of got scared into taking transit. You know, it was the messaging, it was all the planning. And so I have a guilty confession. I showed up to a, a Barclays um, event um, soon after opening, and I, we actually drove in. And I told my husband, there's lots of parking on the street. <laughs> <laughs> there was. I've, I've, and I've, there, I've gone there. Yeah, the so street. it works. Right? <laughs> No, and I like that. I, like, I wish we'd scare more people into transit. It's a great, uh, <laughs> it's a good tactic. But um, and I think this is that's a good pivot point, right? And I want to um, uh, go to Kristen a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit about how we how we get where we need to go, right? And um, I thought it was uh, important that you brought up that there was a sea change kind of at transit where they said we're not replacing one to one. And you know you reference some of your land restrictions or your deed or your easement restrictions. Yes. You know, and so I'd love to hear a little bit from because we know that departments can be like cruise ships. You can't turn them back quickly. Exactly, yeah. And so yeah. how has that been she going? She did it in eight months. I'm pretty. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was happening long before I got there. Um, but yeah, uh, it is. It's hard to to change an agent. Uh, any kind of bureaucracy is hard to change. Um, so this has been happening incrementally over time. Um, and I think, 
you know, it, we're, we're helped by the fact that we have the transit friendly planning team and their transit friendly planning guide and they work with a lot of municipalities um, and sort of set the stage for us with not just with our internal partners, but with our external partners. So that's very helpful. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, it is just super incremental, like Deb talked about with the legislative piece, like you have to really like work hard to make it happen in one location and then prove it and then do it at the next location and then do it at the next location. And then the other thing that I think is really important is um, we as a property owner need to push for um, the creation of places where people want to walk and feel comfortable walking. And um, so that whole like squishy topic of placemaking and human scaled environments and pedestrian friendly stuff, um, it's, that is super hard to quantify, but people know it when they see it. And so the more we can do that, um, you know, the more like we'll be able to point to, you know, just on the road here at, you know, in Red Bank, this is lovely, you know, go to Red Bank, you'll see it, it's only five miles away, you know, because pointing to Paris or Amsterdam, you know, is, <laughs> does not work, right? Or even pointing to, you know, Greenwich Village isn't gonna work, but we need to, we need to prove it. Um, and give people that experience. I really like that though. The proof of concept, I think, is a very important mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so focusing efforts, perhaps, on one thing that you can say, look at the success we had here. You know, I think we'll that's go there. great. And I want to take that, actually, and bring it back to something. I just wanted to give a shout out then to Transit, too, because Transit, I was there in 2002, 2008, and they were promoting TMD in the late 90s. Yeah. And, you know, put together about half a decent plan. Now, that said, when I was there, talking about one one, they wanted more. Right. We built they, more. We, they that. said, yeah. you know, when we yeah. talked to the rail planners, they're like, you know, this is going to last the last 50 years. We need yeah. 500 more spaces. And, like, you know, yeah. it basically would kill any type of TOD or make it. Yeah. That's what Deb and I were doing. I had heard that, but years. I was afraid to say that yeah, yeah. because I was like, what if, what if I'm saying the wrong thing? But I had heard that we actually did require an yeah, increase no, in has anyone been to the Ramsey Route 17 parking structure <laughs> at Transit? I used to live. I used to commute from there. There we go. Half of it, at least, used to be car dealerships yeah, locally stuffing their cars there. I had to do that to put, make some revenue out of it. No, no, that was like we did it to bring that yeah. in, and it seems appropriate. We're, we're it's on store. Route 17, right? But yeah. Well, you know, a lot and of so, but but plan. I want to pivot to something um, that I think is actually really important. It kind of ties a lot of this together, um, and I'd love Jeannie that you brought up the difference in terminology with um, transit-oriented communities. Because if you look at uh, referencing back to uh, our title here, placing people above parking, I didn't actually think of this until you said this just now, but using the term TOD even, is we're centering the built environment. We're not centering the outcome, which is great communities and healthier communities and uh, people, right? And so um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, some of the policies. You know, you discussed the pile-up, which for the record just sounds like a pile-up, which is just <laughs> <laughs> strange. Um, says it was weird to say. Um, but uh, pile-ups and some of these that we've seen some success with um, that kind of have helped us get to that human-focused um, element. Uh, I mean, I can, I can talk about maybe the two. I haven't actually, you know, worked on a pylop, okay. um, but I have um, been part of um, transit center economic development strategies where um, White Plains is a great example in New York, um, where we came up with, you know, how do you, you know, a, a scheme to pay for public realm improvements, right? So commonly known as tax increment financing or other types yeah, of... It, it's redevelopment area bonding in New Jersey. Okay. Because we have to be different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, everybody calls it something Why different. Not? There are different mechanisms. But really, you start with drawing your boundaries, right? And those boundaries are... Um, the entities that will pay into this fund because the benefits are going to happen within that boundary. So it makes perfect sense, right? It's like you're all going to get take advantage of this collective benefit that the public sector will advance, but the private sector needs to contribute, right? So parking is part of that shared benefit. That wasn't necessarily part of the White Plains strategy per se, but I think that is sort of the way you think about it. Um, and so 
you know, again, I think, I don't know why it took me so long to think about TOCs. It was because, you know, we had to, yeah, I had new colleagues from across the border who said, what are TODs? We call them TOCs. Yeah. No, and that's interesting. And reframing it not only as a human thing, but as a public benefit, um, you know. And so I would also like to just open to everyone just to hear, um, are there good examples that we can share um, of either New Jersey or the region just to, to again, proof of concepts, we can take them into our arsenal? Well, I think Rawway is an excellent example. I mean, Rawway was a kind of a multitude of different surface lots, much of which was commuters from out of town. And Rawway made a decision, we're gonna, we're gonna consolidate our parking into a structure. And oftentimes structures are necessary to achieve density on other areas. You know, obviously surface parking is, if, if parking's not the highest but best use, surface parking is certainly not the highest best use. So what they did, and to their credit, uh, and this was a great partnership with New Jersey Transit because they said, look, we really focus on our residents. They need to commute, and we're gonna build something that would support that. However, NJ Transit, there's a lot of people that were coming from outside of Rawway to use that as a facility. We will, if you, you know, if you wanna to contribute to this garage, we'll do it and accommodate that. And long story short, you know, by doing that, they had four or five other development sites that they were able to put out, that they were able to then say to that development site, you don't need to build your park in there, contribute to our facility and you can park here. And so to that point, you have a centralized facility that supports you know, six different projects. And if you've been to Broadway over the last you know, 10 or 15 years, it's tra- you know, not this, you know, that's part of what helped transform it, but it's, it's been transformed to really model TOD 10. I love seeing Broadway out of my train window, but uh, I think another good example is Metuchen, where they allow shared parking for commuters and um, residents and people um, patronizing businesses downtown. Uh, Oh, hello. (laughs) Um, And also, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that you also, you do allow payment in lieu of parking. We have, we did one development. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so payments in lieu of taxes, I get you. Um, I think I think there, you know, Hackensack was one of the first communities to introduce pileups. Um, Jersey City was one of the first communities to introduce parking maximums, right? And so it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? But maybe maximums are a better way to start framing the thinking that the community is realizing there's some parking being built, but right, it's no different than the developer should be the one responsible to define the unit mix that they're building, right? It's my job as a developer to know what the market demands. How many one bedrooms, two bedrooms, what size should they be? And that's not something that should be left in municipal planning, right? It's, it's, it's my job to build the, the product that will meet the market, and so it's my job to also realize that parking is part of that component, and so it should right size. Well, no, no, go ahead. I didn't know how we could participate, but that's what that's what I don't understand. I'm from Asbury Park, and if a developer comes in and is willing to build a hotel mm-hmm. and doesn't care that they're not going to, in the planning board or the city's opinion, going to be enough parking, why do we care? Let them build a hotel. Am I missing something here? Yeah. Public opinion. Perfect. So, um, yeah, so um, I did want to have a few questions before we okay. open up, but I will, I will address sorry. this though, but I will that's say. what you just said. It, it, it goes back to the, the first thing, and I'll speak directly to Asbury Park, I live in Neptune, um, which is the town next door. Um, Asbury Park did the thing a lot of towns did in COVID where they shut down Cookman, which is not, it's a main street, and it's totally not necessary for circulation, like at all. And uh, the second COVID was over, they were like, no, we're not doing that again. And everyone got a little upset. They said, well, why not? Everyone loved it. It was great. And they said, well, some business owners complained. No specificity. Would not do it. And so there are, it's literally feeling and perception that goes with us. And that's, and that's why I'm not, that's why I wanted to start this conversation talking about the importance of psychology because it is often underrated. And I have watched countless people go to meetings and they have their facts. And they're like, let me tell you, I'm going to tell you all the facts. And you're going to obviously believe that. And it's very important to understand in any sort of advocacy that just because we have 
shared information does not mean we are drawing the same conclusions from that. Mm -hmm. And that is, bad, that is not even fake news, that like uh, concept <laughs> there, it, it just is what it is, right? Um, and so I think we can get into that a little bit more. But I just want to add yeah. one point for that, that I think bridges the divide, right? Municipalities do not take enough advantage of the power of what having a parking authority can do for them. Mm -hmm. And and if the parking authority, you have the municipal agent, you have that public entity facilitating this on the town's behalf, right? It's not the developer, big fat greedy developer coming in going, this is what this is what I want, right? And this is what I got over on the town. Having downtown special improvement districts and business improvement districts is critical, right? It allows for those shuttle service systems, right? And so the conversation is also about critical mass and who can pay into that intermodal system of transportation. So sure, it's very easy for the planner or the mayor to tell the developer, we'll just shuttle people to the service, to the train. That's $100,000 a year. Versus if we have a bid, we could set up a, sh a shuttle service that drops throughout the downtown and all the apartment buildings are paying into it and some of the business owners are paying into it as well, but it's servicing everybody. Um, so Port Imperial, which is Hudson River waterfront, and it's not urban, okay? It's waterfront, it's, there's, there's light rail and there's ferry, but it's just horizontal density. It is a master association of 6,000 units paying into a shuttle system that brings two miles worth of properties to and from the ferry with a bridge over to the light rail. But that's thousands of units paying into that. And so when you can set up the municipal structures um, and have those administrative parameters in place, it's not always coming from the developer, but it is that, it is that true public-private partnership that it is also carrying the, the municipality's planning vision forward. Um, and, and I don't think enough towns realize the power of an authority and, and some settle for a utility and some just aren't even sophisticated enough to, to, to have them or need them. Um, but if everybody wants downtown walkable downtowns, I suggest a parking authority. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I think a lot of you who've ever worked uh, for nonprofits and you're like, oh, I would love to do that, but my board, you can point upwards and just remove some of that pressure from yourself. Um, and so I do want to make sure we have time uh, for Q&A, but I thought it was really important just to um, address, uh, just going back to some of the legislative regulatory change, because that's kind of like on the, on the move right now, hopefully. Um, and so I just wanted to um, open up to the group a little bit to talk about what would be the impact of an RSIS change? Um, and Debbie kind of mentioned having to think past that. This is a good first step. Um, and so if there's uh, some functional things that we can um, bring to the group about um, what this would mean and where we need to be going long term, uh, that would be great. Practically speaking, all things being equal, less parking, less cost to build that, that means there's potentially, right, automatically there's reduced rent. There's also potentially reduced conversations about how aggressive of a pilot and tax abatement the developer might be, right? All things being equal. I can't sit here and say what should be done with the rest of the footprint that you don't need parking on. But that does allow for open space, right? It does allow for more community amenities. Um, it does allow for greater density. Right, which addresses the housing affordability issue, which I think, in full honesty, is going to be part of the pushback in the conversation as we move into 2025 affordable housing obligation. Um, and so I, the way we speak about these things is going to become very critical because I do think there will be a sector that spins this into an anti-affordable housing Conversation. You actually saw that, right? Uh, that was the first press release from uh, the Republican uh, uh, Party after the parking bill passed was tying it directly to affordable housing and how that's terrible. Yeah, but, but we can't keep increasing our DEP regulations and standards and requiring more and more stormwater management and keep holding more and more concrete, right? And so there, there's this is a, a, a sustainability conversation, it's an affordability conversation, um, it's a community benefit conversation. 
Um, I, I, you know, there's there's a lot of potentials of what could be done with that excess footprint, um, but that's part of being involved in the uniqueness of that local municipality and what is that community. Yeah, I, I would just add kind of to your point. You know, developers are their own very optimistic, but the uh, but you know they know they they know what they have to do to get finance, the market, all that, and. You know, and it cuts both ways. You know, I, you know, obviously, I think there should be some more reliance on what their expertise says they need. And we've had to, I've, I've recommended a parking ratio lower, and the said, no, we're doing, you know, we're doing high end housing. They're both production, especially multifamily housing. And um, if New Jersey is able to provide more um, and provide, you know, that transit friendly. Um, option, you know, you're going to, I mean, the developers know who you're going to attack, right? These are, and, and these are the folks who may not have thought of New Jersey, but you're going to go and check out a great product in a great community, and um, I think that just is a huge economic driver. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the benefits are, you know, can be broad, they can be economic, there's certainly uh, sustainability benefits, um, affordability benefits. Um, so I think, and it will also help us as we work with developers um, and, and try to push for lower parking ratios in the, in the private aspect of the development, those lower um, requirements would be very helpful. Absolutely. Usually the irony of how much parking the transit building has is not lost on me. <laughs> <laughs> Things like four floors of parking. No, it's just, it, it, uh, no, no. But that's also a result of the planning of the rail system. They anticipated that that was going to be the, the, you know, and have a significant pull of people to that area. So it's not that they. Oh, I mean the transit it. office. Oh, so, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, NJ Transit, where are you? No, no. In Newark? Yeah. The one that had Blue Cross Blue Shield? Because Blue Cross Blue Shield used to occupy that building and had like 400 to 1,000 vehicles. Oh, no, no, I, I know. I yeah. Making sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, I do want to open it up to questions. Um, and starting with Courtney, <laughs> very. Uh, I just want to say, because we, we, we need to set up a bit. We need to set up a bit. want to set up a bit. No, I just want to also say, like, these conversations, we, we hope that you will be conversational as well. So if you have a lesson learned, please feel free to share that. Um, just don't wax for 20 minutes. Um, but please do. But I, and I'm going to do exactly that. And we're talking about Hathbury Park and Clinton Avenue and using Jersey City Newark Avenue as an example. You know, first of all, they started as tactical urbanism, um, shutting, shutting down, first it was one block, then it was two blocks, and then it was this and that. But I think using data to tell the story, to make it less emotional is important, um, so, so that you don't have those people who come, in, the, the two business owners who want their parking spot to stay. I talked to, for example, the hardware store, who by the numbers said, I when they shut down that first summer, I had more business, which makes sense for a small little hardware store. Nobody's, you're going to Home Depot if you need to pick up the stuff with your car and your truck. But for the little stuff, just having to walk by, oh, I'm gonna pop in the hardware store and grab whatever, I need the keys, I need this hammer, whatever. And his business went up, and I think so, if you have a bid or an economic development officer, or whatever, when you're going to try these tactical urbanism exercises, I think it's important to try to get your businesses to give you the data so that you can support and say, it was a success from an economic standpoint, and that's why we need to do it. Um, and now, you know, the, the pedestrian mall, it was, you know, we had vacancies, we had this, and it's, it's great. The businesses that are there, it's thriving, and it's because this bid and the city took the lead to do it. So that's just my little story about telling story to be It's true. Yeah. yeah. Tim. Yeah, picking up on uh, Courtney's point, I'm going to directly contradict your friend, Zoe, and say that you all should continue bringing facts to, to a <laughs> <laughs> Very I'm, I'm in the business of producing facts to other people to bring up feelings, spice, and uh, 
I want to encourage you to keep doing it. And on that point, um, Kristen, I, 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 I hear your point about it's really hard to quantify what walkability looks like, but I've actually tried to do that. And I feel like I've done a serviceable job because when I compare it to things like vehicle ownership, the relationship that you would expect shows up. So maybe we should compare notes about like what other kinds of data you've got that I could compare to my metrics of walkability. And even then with the, the new study, maybe we could compare parking usage to my measures of what the development pattern looks like and produce some more facts to bring to the next field. This is exactly why we have these. And I do want to clarify that I was being a little flippant with that. And so I think the key here, though, and what we got out of the conversation following that is taking the facts and not just presenting them as these are the facts. You have to weave a story. You have to tell the human side of this. And again, people over parking, right? We need to center the humans and the community um, in that. And I'm sorry, uh, there's uh, some fit for kind yeah, of. I'm Esther Park, too. Esther Park from Blue Juice Coalition. And I love right. hearing the connection between Red Bank and Jersey City, Asbury Park. We really are all connected by partly by Mandela, who is very connected to Jersey City. And one of the things that he described to us when we were up visiting and had lunch with him was that um, quick build. You know, he, as being bold and making a decision to do something, knowing that, that it works and that a larger, sometimes quieter part of the community really wants it. The people who don't want things are much louder. The people who are the negative communities, they really make a lot of noise. And as you mentioned, on Cookman, which I like to refer to as the open street, not closed. You know, it's open for pedestrians, open for, for you know, walking and, and shopping and, and just hanging out it, uh, rather than a closed street, rather than closing it to, to cars. So but the bottom line is that in a city like Asbury Park, where we are becoming a 12-month city, it's not just a, uh, a destination for it within the season. The problem of traffic largely, and you mentioned this earlier, is looking for parking. It's a point of looking for parking in the business district. That's what traffic is. And nobody is going to be able to always find the spot within 15 feet of your destination. It's just not going to happen. So what we need to do is reduce the dependence on cars, which then leads to transit. And it's really like Asbury Park. It should be completely walkable. It's only 1.4 miles there. So but still, people are so wedded to their cars, and they are so desperate to just be able to drive everywhere and park anywhere that they want to, even residents, not just visitors. So my hope is that in Asbury, and I'm just throwing it out there, Jersey City has VIA for VIA, right, the 24 7 transit. I don't know if Asbury Park can afford it, but um, in terms of businesses buying in, um, understanding that this would be a benefit to everybody, to completely eliminate parking on Cookman, which is not a part of the a conduit to get anywhere, it's just Cookman, um, and, and provide parking elsewhere. If it's a parking garage, which is under consideration right now, it would also be retail. Put it near the train station. Zero parking around the, the business district. So these are the things that we're thinking about in Edward Park and talking about all the time. Um, I love solutions, but I don't know, just a really quick solution. Don't put a fire station next to your train station. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happening right now. It's very <laughs> Go ahead. No, we, we were working in Asbury, and we were, the team that kind of was working on siting a garage, which we did just back you know, by the train station, and the idea there was to support Cookman as kind of a, right. and to actually kind of maybe absorb all the municipal parking that could then be developed, the train station and the police station, or the municipal site. So, COVID kind of put that on hold, but Are you still be happy to come back. And you've, you've already had the conversation? And it was, it was, the planning was well underway. I mean, we had gotten to about a schematic design level. I think the conversation has reignited. Yeah. No, no pun intended for the fire. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, when they talk about, okay, we just got to get it under. But when they talk about, and, and where are you from, Jersey City? I'm no, Asbury. Asbury. Asbury Park. I mean, Asbury Park. Park. Complete Streets Coalition. Oh, well, we're an advocacy group for walking and rolling and... Oh, well, I'm the um, urban enterprise of business development person, so... Let's talk. I've been... <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking to the Red Bank, too. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, so when, and what I was thinking about when you were talking about the emotional, and you hit right on it, the first thing, um, here's the problem. 
Okay, in, in Asbury Park, we have just the right amount of parking, but nobody knows that because my son studies with um, um, the man who wrote the high cost of oh, yeah, shoe at, and I love every time the, the highest time in Jersey in Asbury Park when I'm driving down the street and I see a car pull out then I see a car pull in. I've never seen like all the, and the only traffic that is created is from people driving around looking for a parking spot. So everybody here seems like they will, and, and the state in general, and, and maybe through the country, we want to reduce parking requirements. I think you might be overestimating. Okay. <laughs> well, we wouldn't be up here. <laughs> okay, well, definitely not in New Jersey, but, but I think, learned people, the thoughtful people know that we pulled these parking requirements out of nowhere and they're, they're not supported by the data, so we need to decrease them. But in Asbury, they're already decreased, so we can't go the other way and start increasing them because that just doesn't make any sense. So about the garage, that, okay, they think that the, um, traffic coming out of the garage is going to be just over the top. I would go to Montclair. They did a really good job with that. It's basically the same cost as street parking. And um, I remember before that, it was it, residential neighborhoods are getting a lot of parking like that garage. I, I haven't, I don't use it that much, but like when I lived in North Jersey, I remember that being a really great option, you know. Um, because it was so bad, uh, I would actually ride my bike from Newark when I lived in Newark for a long time uh, to Montclair because it was much easier. And so I want to get someone new back here. Hi, from Montclair. Ah, look at this. Better did. <laughs> we have we don't have a parking problem. We have a perception problem. One of our problems is that we have too many decks, and the decks are a lot more expensive to park in than our street parking. Oh, it was. I remember it used, there was that one lot on that little back street that It used. costs a dollar to park on the street and two bucks to park in our garage. Oh, maybe I was just willing to absorb that. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to, we're, we're, as coming from bid, we are in this big process of trying to convince our parking authority, or the utility, I'm not sure which, um, to change that so that it's, we want to incentivize people to go into the water that. Because everyone says they want to park right smack dab in front of the restaurants or in front of their. We didn't hear Eric Adams. And, um, <laughs> so, my question is Does anyone have, a, do, you, do you know of a successful New Jersey marketing program for the, to deal with the perception in? We have lots of spices. Our decks are empty, as you said, most of the time, except for two really large events. You almost every time you can drive right in and find a spot, be out in a second, um, as opposed to driving around in circles. But people don't recognize that that's that. And I grew up in New York City where I never drove, I didn't have a driver's license until I was 24, because who drives to New York City, right? It's stupid. Um, that's not where most people in Montclair come from. They can't imagine having to walk more than a block. Um, so I'm, I'd love to know what you could suggest. Signage. What is that? Signage. Sorry, yep. So Anglewood is an example of bad signage. Right? They, <laughs> have, they have great Main Street. They built a parking garage half a block off the Main Street with apartments in front of it, but nobody knew the garage was there. Yeah. And so the retail was empty. Um, and that system-wide mentality and system-wide parking and directionals and integrating that into, you know, wireless charging stations on, the, on your sidewalks and you know retail business directories in your on your in your downtowns and all that other placemaking stuff that bids focus on. Um, you just have to. It's Fidelity does a good job with the green arrow. Like you just have to show people. Where to go? Morristown, everybody knows how to get to the garages when it's snowing because they offer free parking. Everybody, all of a sudden, everybody can find the garage, right? <laughs> um, it, it, signage is a very cheap, sorry, inexpensive uh, way to just educate. You know, just to your point, you know, pricing strategy is key. I mean, it's 
you know, and you can do a couple options. One is demand by, so you know, most highly packed streets in Montclair, you want to, you know, raise those up. Or even do what's called progressive pricing. So you have a lower rate for an hour, but then that third hour, that fourth hour, you're, you're well exceeding the cost of a garage so that that really motivates the longer term parker to get into a garage. And enforcement. You know, if you have a two hour limit, nobody likes to do time limit enforcement, but now with LPR technology, it's a lot easier. You know, you got to keep people turning over. But pricing is another Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Steve Grillo, um, member of the DNJ board and uh, executive director of the Bid in Milburn Short Hills. Um, a little levity. When I was a, a grad student, my professor told me, if we're ever going to amend the U.S. Constitution, we need to put parking in the Second Amendment because those are two rights. <laughs> um, and I've always kept that, that theory. Um, I think the question concerning Montclair and what Deb mentioned, um, we've invested quite a bit in signage in our downtown and other areas to try to drive people to our parking deck. Our parking deck is not located in the heart of downtown, and so many folks don't know it's there. So we've actually started capturing them as soon as they enter the town from Springfield. Um, and it's worked really, really well. We work with Commercial District Services, who's also a, a DNJ partner. And um, we put in probably now 30 new signs throughout the town. Um, which has been really, really helpful. And we also put signage on the deck. Um, when they built it, they didn't put any sign letting people know. Um, and so we've invested in that, and it's really helped. Um, my question, and the struggle we have in Milburn, um, it was just mentioned, enforcement. Um, license plate readers are going to help us um, in terms of how we can monitor this parking lot being such a manual issue. Any thoughts from your experience on enforcement? Um, I think that is the... The weak link in the chain that we have in our town is, is getting people to uh, to stop standing when they're doing delivery pickups. Um, double parking is a major issue. Um, so just curious to see your thoughts on enforcement. Well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I mean, I, I ran the New Brunswick Parking Authority and Camden was the general director. And it, it's, it's just without a proper enforcement, nothing you're going to do related to parking policy is going to be well adhered to. And a lot of it is, you know, it's fair and consistent. You know, you can't do it, you can't barrage people and then not, not do it for months. And, and I think really what you see in a lot of municipalities is the, the hours, the extension. I mean, it really needs, if you have a fairly robust downtown that's going into the early evenings, you need to enforce until, you know, into the evenings. Now, nobody likes to get a parking ticket. And that, as a, as a matter of fact, I don't want to talk about a specific example. I asked Park years ago when they first implemented pay station. The first weekend they issued a thousand tickets. <laughs> the, uh, so I think there's, 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 there's got to be a sensitivity but a consistency. And I, I even think if you're embarking on a new, uh, you know, understanding how important it is, you can start with warnings, you know, and, and frequently asked questions. When I was in New Brunswick, we wrote a, you know, a pamphlet at the time, but digital, it says, why do you enforce? Safety issues, turnover parking, you know, loading zones, all this to kind of help reduce the amount of traffic. So I, I just think it's an educational issue, it's a communication, and if it's kind of embarking on a new weapon, a new level within a town, you don't want to just start dropping tickets, and talking to the bid community and having whoever is managing the parking uh, for, the, for the town of Milburn to go and talk and say, look, this is why we're doing it. We're trying to turn the space over two to three times a day so it's not just one person there. And, and I think technology is really meaningful. Now it's illegal to chalk tires. You actually <laughs> chalk really? the tire. Yeah. 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 They, they do it in deal. Well, there, it's, there was a there was a Supreme Court. You know, you can't touch somebody's car. And, and plus, it was pain. Yeah, yeah. It, it's painful to do for an enforcement officer. Really difficult, and it's time consuming. But now, with license plate recognition, just ride by. You were there two hours ago. You got a picture. You got everything. So I, I think it comes down to just having you know the appropriate level, the appropriate times, and then communicating to your community why you're doing. Why it's important. So. I think it's important to talk about um, the loading zones too. I think there's not enough because every you know, everything's getting delivered all the time, especially 
even the local residential now because everybody's Amazon this and, and, and everything. So having sufficient loading spaces, I think, important to, to prevent, particularly the, the, the freight type of double parking. And then, but then you have to enforce it. You can't let park cars. And I do it in Jersey City because it's not enforced, so I'm constantly in the loading zone. I'm like, I just need to run in and run out, right? <laughs> and or if they have 15 minute parking as well for the run in and run out, because a lot of those owners are parking right in front of their darn store. Yep. When I just need to go in and out, right? Problem There's no parking for me, so I'm parking in the loading zone, I'm parking on the corner, yeah, yeah. et cetera. I'm ha I, I am a bad planner, I will admit. It. <laughs> but, and then, but then also, so once you get it down and you have enough loading, also enforcing the trucks, because some of them are like, oh my god, I have to walk to the end of the block with this wheel thing of beer. Like, yes, you do. You don't just get to park, double park in front of the store. So I think it's having sufficient and enforcing. Yeah, yeah. And, and technology, you know, for off-street, it's a lot more difficult for on-street, but off-street facilities, you know, even if they're not gated or anything, like they can be monitored, varied, there is technologies to know what level of occupancy is in that facility. And then that can be transmitted, you know, obviously you can have digital signage, there's 30 spaces available, so you're not driving in and circling it. And that can be communicated on web-based devices. So mm -hmm. if I'm going to Asbury Park, I can say, okay, this lot's full, I'm gonna go here. So there are, there are options like, as well as that. But loading zones, I, yeah, like loading zones are getting out of hand. I mean, you know, I drive home and I'm just, I go, where are the enforcement people? Because they're there's this crazy double parking and all they don't care. And a lot of the, you know, the these Sandys, the delivery entities, they got massive budgets to pay back, like millions of dollars of I think it's they pay. Uh, so we so should they don't care. You know, yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 How do you pay for your uh, parking garage? UPS, I heard, has a budget and a department in every major city just to fight and handle parking fines. They have a department in the city. That's scary. Believable. So yes, take advantage of your business. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and I did want to just uh, bring up one other uh, component of this just to keep people. So first of all, don't forget about the suburbs, right? Because I could follow the earlier comment. A lot of it, like New Jersey doesn't have that many actual cities. We call a lot of things cities, but they're kind of designed ones actually, relatively suburban. Um, and we, we've seen these suburban designs in some of these denser communities. And so I would love to hear from uh, this group a little bit about the interplay between the, the design and uh, the the communities that are building these and how those how that's like a uh, symbiotic relationship. Right, um, so working with the community to make sure that they're open to these things, or having communities feel more comfortable pushing back on a shop right uh, who wants to put uh, their grocery store near a bus stop, but perhaps a quarter mile of parking lot between them and that bus stop instead of uh, less parking and perhaps in the back. Or that was just a random example from my career, but, um, but yeah. So the design part has a piece of the middle. You want to do that right? Um, I'm trying to, is the, the, the clock right <laughs> here in your house? <laughs> I have an example. It's a touch -up. The whole Foods was built. Um, it's just outside of the downtown proper, um, Main Street. But it's downtown, but it's, yeah, but it's not on Main Street. But the, there are pedestrian accommodations. If you walk from Main Street the whole way into the shopping center, Right, like you, you, that actually has priority over the parking, so you don't feel like you're going to get hit by people who are parking if you walk from the main street to the Whole Foods. And I think that's like some thought that people need to do in the designing of these parking lots. Well, all so all the way through, all the way through the other side to go into the neighborhood. So yeah. connected. So my immediate gut reaction to your question is, okay, a surface parking space costs $3,000, but a structured parking space could cost 30, right? So the answer for what the design is, it's a correlation of how much height am I gonna get in zoning? And will the rent support any type of structured parking, even ground floor for a four story over one, or am I building true structured parking, right? What can the market support? 
if I'm looking, you know, I, I, I'm working on something in South Jersey, and the development plan is a form-based code for 10 stories. And I said, that's wonderful. I can't, uh, like, the market will not support anything over four stories. Um, and so, uh, as you were talking in the earlier conversation on, on parking management, to me, the design is, is it's a financial analysis and, and a market-driven what belongs here, who wants to be here. But it, it is a preliminary planning exercise of what what do we want this core to be. So like my when somebody asked like what's the best parking management system, my immediate response was like go support the liquor license legislation <laughs> <laughs> because it's going to change fundamentally what downtown mixed juice becomes. Right? It's it's going to expand on what we know works, and it's going to allow that downtown the downstairs footprint to actually be occupied and thrive with people who want to live on top or nearby and don't need a car to experience it. Well, um, plus, be much more Uber than Right, <laughs> right. So it's 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 that initial. What are we trying to? What's that critical mass of what we're trying to create here? And then it's what can I afford to build here? And then it's and then it's a zoning fight with the town on how many, or how much stories and how much density because I you can't. Fit it all. I just sat with a town who has a municipal parking lot at their train station. They want to redevelop it. They have 250 parking spaces, and and they want to limit it ideally to three stories. And they want you know a civic center. And they want. And I'm going like, I don't know what town. You know. <laughs> so it, it it it's a puzzle, um, but it starts with what is that? What is the highest and best use of what we're trying to create here? Um, and creating the, the zoning parameters to allow that to happen. And every parking lot you guys own, bring to the RFP that you're bringing a liquor license. Yeah. You can just do that. You can do that. You have that power. Everyone here is jealous. I can do that, actually, yes. Um, but, but in addition to in addition to liquor licenses, which uh, I, I hear you on that, I mean, I think we also... Need I we learned some lessons over time and we need to be more um, intentional about um, making sure that whoever we're working with our our municipal partners and our development partners understand that access is is about pedestrians first um, and and active forms of mobility first and that that translates into design requirements right like the width of sidewalks four feet is not going to be acceptable, you know what I mean? So like from our perspective as a property owner, we need to be more clear about designing for human scaled environments. And that includes, you know, trying to break down some of the big box footprints, um, which is easier said than done. Well, and Metro Park is a great example. We get this wonderful, most one of the busiest transit stations on the system and hundreds of thousands of square feet, you know, within a half mile, but it's not walkable. It's underutilized as a result. But one great example of a suburban is uh, the district project that's uh, being, I think it got approved. It's, uh, I don't know where it is, but a huge, massive, kind of typical suburban office, seas of surface parking, and now it's going to be this really, really exciting big huge development with a lot of residential, you know, all types of amenities. and. And, you know, the parking, you know, they went to, you know, shared parking to reduce parking ratios. And, you know, the town in Berkeley Heights, which is a total suburban town, and they got it. And they, they got it, and it's going to be really a special place, I think. Once, once right. And I think on the suburban side, it's good to think about these transit-oriented communities as multi-generational projects. So, so you know, the, the folks who are likely to live in multifamily housing, mixed-use districts near transit, are going to be younger, right? Maybe they won't, maybe before they have kids, maybe they won't be married, and then older people. And then you've got the suburban community that gives you the options to kind of spread out, have a home. And so you see it as sort of like housing for all. Um, and I think that's a great way to kind of sell it, right? You, like the whole community's character doesn't change. You're just providing uh, more choices. That's a really good distinction. I really like that um, distinction. So um, back over here. 
Hi, um, my name is CJ Ricci. I'm a planner at Stonefield Engineering. Um, and I testify in front of a lot of boards, uh, specifically for transit-oriented development projects. Um, and usually, like you said, the cities react pretty well to it. They've adopted the development plan, lower the parking requirements, and they're pretty receptive. The problem that I always have is the public. And you know, we show them the data. We say, hey, this works. Economic benefits. You could walk to the grocery store. You could walk to that corner store. By the time you get to the public comment section, they're sometimes just saying, we get it, but we don't want it. We don't want it. We want our cars, we want our Walmarts. And I think the big thing here is how do we just educate, we have those tips on just educating you know, the general public on the benefits of TOD and showing them how, you know, how special these places can be. I think that's a really difficult hurdle. It's just educating people. You know, we have the legislation in place, we have parking, you know, the, the maximum in place. Now it's let's educate the world, the community, the public, how this could be how this could be great. So all I want to say is that unfortunately what happens at public meetings is people who are actually in the incentives, they're not your audience for whom you yeah. will build the housing. Mm -hmm. So it's changing where the conversation happens. It can't only happen there. It has to happen in other places. And, and that's, a, that's a much harder thing to do, and it's a thing that we all want to do it. But, you know, that is sort of an endemic problem with the public, the engagement process with the public. And I, would, I would just add to that a couple, you know, like Mitunch and you know, we worked on that project. Uh, Westfield, I think, is you need to have advocates as well. For every person that speaks against it, then you find someone who will speak for it. And I've, I've just seen that work wonders with this council. People sit there, that makes their decision that much easier. And, and it can't be the developer who's trying to educate yeah. and convince them. Exactly. The conversation has That's to happen it. before the redevelopment plan is adopted, yeah. right? Um, and think of how many towns held forums trying to explain what a tax abatement was and why pilots work and are necessary, right? It's the same educational process. The question is, does the community really want to be educated? Or do they just want to say that they want to be educated and you're not being transparent, right? Um, but but it cannot be on the onus of the developer to prove it. And that is, you know, there there is always that um, healthy tension between the municipality and the developer early on in that concept plan process, designation process, how are you going to do the community engagement, right? Nobody should be surprised at the hearing. But by the time that developer is at the table talking to the town, that framework has to be established. Um, and that's part of the master plan visioning and you know and, and redevelopment plan process um, and and hosting forums, right? You host a you host a forum on you know first time home buyers, you know, we want to help you with this, we want to educate you on this. And it, it, it it's part of the municipality's responsibility to be part of that education. I would also like to throw out that there are fantastic nonprofit research organizations that would love private sector money to make, give you data about the value of um, some of these things. Uh, but uh, got a little, oh, sorry. Just a quick plug for our transit friendly planning guide, which is very helpful when talking with municipalities. It's a, it's a good tool to use. Somebody asked about tools. Uh, yeah, and so uh, we have green shirt and then black. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to have to you, I'm probably going to ask in Collinswood, and I was just going to say, really, find your advocate and build that relationship with them 24 7, 365, you know, because they become not just your advocates for a particular project, but they become the people that can, can speak to, you know, the idea of, you know, all, all the things that we've been talking about today. Uh, um, you know better than I. You know we sat through those planning boards, but everybody spoke against it. But somebody spoke for it. And, if, and I think I'll just add, you know, something what TJ asked. I think it's come to serve me well that when I speak to members of the public or opponents of the project or proponents for a project for that matter, that if they go off the planner hat or if you're an engineer, you take off the engineer hat, the developer hat. You just talk to them like you're talking to someone on the street. You start throwing out jargon like TOD or if you're in Canada, TOC, their eyes are going to gloss over. And they say, oh, here we go again. Similarly, if you've been in planning board or zoning board hearings and up comes a traffic engineer, 
everyone starts, okay, here we go. And they wait and they listen to the objective that come up anyway. But if you can talk to people, and it's, it's a skill, we have to practice and learn, take out the jargon, talk to them like, well, okay, this is why it's good, in, in just layman's terms, day to day. And I think that serves, um, that's something we need to do better at, at least in the planning community. You'll have a, just kind of general comment, maybe getting hopes all the way here. So I lived in Sandalwood uh, for many years, and like four months, where I think I'll let it go. Um, so I, I just want to go back, I think there's some conversation we talk about actually in the, uh, the public, and I think someone made a comment about like there are less people getting, like, getting driver licenses. So this is a reflection on the message and engaging the younger generation. And I want to share that is like, well, I have two daughters, they're 18 and 21. So one of my daughter when she was five years old, this is many years ago. So I was in New York City in the Central Park, and we were just, you know, visiting this, this Central Park for a day. We finished the bottle, the, the bottle of water, and I was going to toss that bottle of water in the trash can. My five years old, I'm not seven, <laughs> told me that, no, it's recyclable. You have to find a recyclable trash to put it. And I literally carried that bottle <laughs> for the level of the day, because my five years old, I'm sure was learned from school, that the message is. But fast forward. At 18 and 21, and a very, um, you know, the, the, the nice to hear that I that it, I'm at walkable to family train stations. I walk in the city, but my kid through the years that they don't want to drive the city, they actually make comments about I prefer to ride a train, even on the Raritan line, have the train. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they would ride a train, they would be totally preferring to drop them off and kind of drive the car. To park because they don't have to pay for parking. But, but the point is, I, I think going back to bringing the advocacy on the younger generations, and my younger daughter in particular is very into like environmental, like, you know, the carbon reduction. So the message for her from the school and kind of like as parents and, 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 and this growing up here is really sharing that from south in the house. To the community, I think it's very important. And I just want to say there's some positive. <laughs> uh, this I'm right. of that. Yeah, so this is my comment. I think this goes back to the fact that it's not the 21 year olds who come to play. Right. Yeah. 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 So if, 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 if we yeah. had 50 percent of our planning board meeting attendance under the age of 30, you would have different decisions being made. 100 percent. Yeah. And, and because the people who share with us at a meeting are my age and above, you get pushback on things that are trying you're trying to do in order to make things more walkable and livable. And, and, and this is an actual problem that the planning community is trying to address. So I think part of the problem too is, is engaging the youth through the schools if possible, but also um, Edgar Park happens to have, probably have uh, like half the population is either at or below the poverty line. And I'm maybe taking old data, but and it's pretty much concentrated in one quadrant of the city. And those people walk and roll. And they are the audience that doesn't come to, to meetings. They, they don't. They're busy. Or they don't even know. Or they don't have internet. And um, so engaging with whoever your audience is, that is really critical. I'm not really sure how to get those folks to come to a meeting or how to engage with them, unless it's creating a special event or you go to um, them. You go to them. Yeah. Go to them. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to bring up two going things. Going to that neighborhood and offering um, food refreshments and making it be an event that they want to come to. So um, we've tried. We've done some of that engaged with the Westside Community Center group and the you know, it's it's helpful in getting messaging out, but I'm not I'm not a professional at all, so I don't have that I don't have that voice. But the planners and the people who do the negotiating should, and um, and they could. A tiny town like it's very good for sure. You know, that's great. I, I want to just add one thing because of the organization you represent today, um, and to tie it to your comment about um, the, the young kids leading it, right? Because I think a lot of people in this room have that experience. Safe routes to school is a great program, and it really does instill those types of values because I don't know about anyone else in the room, but like I lived in New York for a long time. And when I have suburban friends come over, they're like, wait, we're walking how far? I'm like, we are not driving a mile down the street right now. That is not happening, I'm sorry, even if it's raining. 
But then my friends from the city would come and they're like, oh, nothing. Like, you know, it wasn't, and it's such a cultural thing. And um, so I think that that kind of programming with youth is easier in, in some communities to kind of push forward. And then separately, I do want to add one thing I thought that was beautiful with um, Newark's most recent master plan uh, redesign process. They had a lot of success with Facebook Live. And I thought that was really interesting because people were joining from their phones. And you have to be prepared if you have, you know, because then you have people that are like coming on and complaining about all sorts of things, not germane to the conversation at hand. But I think that it, it, is, it is trickier, but I think that there are tools that we can do through having conversations like this. Um, and I believe someone right next to it. Yep. Yeah, my, I have a question, Jim, for you, because you made a statement earlier that resonated with me where you said sometimes you just have to have leaders who say, we're going to do this. And what do you do when you don't? <laughs> <laughs> you do not in Asbury Park. And you can near 10 years. <laughs> we know these people. They're good people. But they are all about consensus. Your point about Cookman Avenue, that as soon as some business owners push back, they cave. They're not here. Holly tries to get them to go up to Red Bank, see if they go on Broadway there, to talk to see. Don't even want to educate me. themselves They sent me. Okay, well, they sent me. the mayor, the council, if they are not on board, what do you do? Anybody else win? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, the development community knows. We, we know who's pro-development and who's not. So it's a question of how much effort do you want out of us? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very challenging, you know, like, like Deb said, you know, developers are going to make selections of where they go based on what they know, you know, support they're going to get, their professional planning, you know, support they're going to get. So uh, it's a really tough question. And, and, you know, like, you know, New Jersey, and I'm not an expert by any means, have so many different forms of government. Some are rotating mayors where nobody really wants to make a tough decision. Um, but it's... I, I, I don't know that I have an answer for you, to be honest with you, but I can just, you know, I'll just, you know, we worked recently with Westfield, which, you know, I won't use the word transformative because we talked about it, but they, you know, just as, you know, a major accomplishment and a lot of it was just because the mayor said, you know, this is the right thing and not, not that it was her, like she did a lot of, you know, due diligence and education and, financial analysis and had all the right people around her, but, you know, she never wavered. And as a result, you know, this plan got through, which was, you know, very, very significant. So, but, so I don't, I don't know what to, how to really clearly respond to that other than, you know, whatever community interaction or, or, or people within the community that want the same thing and, you know, I guess I advocate it. Probably, again, it's a little bit outside my realm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why the advocacy groups are so important to your yeah. point, but sometimes it's really pushing against the wind. And I, and I don't, you know, and maybe I would say it's behind closed doors, not necessarily trying to do it in public. Because if, if something's so meaningful in town, you know, you'd like to think that people that have been elected will really listen and entertain, you know, what you're saying. It's, it's also the consultants that the municipality hires. Because they buffer that person sitting on the dais, right? And so, hey, you know, that's where you can push and pull and recommend, you know, as a, as, a, as a governing agent, you don't always have to be the one pushing it, right? Um, and, and so it's also very telling the municipal consultants that are hired and, and how effective are they, how much authority, and how much deference are they given in that process? I think they also follow the money. I think there has been a shift with the way the money's coming down from the feds, from the state, et cetera. I think we're going to start to see the political shift. It's not going to be, we're not giving you money to just resurface a road. We're giving you safe routes to school money. We're giving you, so I'm hoping that will also, because money, money means a lot, right? Um, and that's where the money is now. It's in, in the safety, the transit, the, the TOD. So, and, hopefully. And while we have somebody from the state here, although I know you're not representing the state, there is a state-owned parking lot right in the middle of downtown Asbury Park. And we need to get the state to have a dialogue with us about sharing parking and everything else you're talking about. Because 
that lot is just sitting there and nobody works in that state building across the street. I've, I've investigated the whole thing. I know. <laughs> so we are somebody calling me. Uh, uh, sure. No, I, 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 I would email the I don't Treasury know. does owns all the property for the state or something. I mean, what 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 will do the do previous use of it? Excuse me? Who used it? Who was the actual user? The user the is the state. Um, no, oh, one, uh, one, Dyfus and. DCA um, used to be there. Uh, so not DCA anymore. Dyfus and. Uh, I have it in my office. Okay. Dyfus and, like, the public defender, maybe? I don't know. Okay. I was just wondering because that would be where I would start to find no, no. it. Um, I know Treasury, but Treasury is not going to care about what's the property. Is. Nobody in the state cares. You know somebody who might care. You need to find out. Why don't you um, um, talk to Ben? Talk to Senator Lepal. Yeah. yeah. He'll give you the contact okay. that was the right person. Yeah. He'll, his folks will help you set that out. I don't um, want to take everybody's time to get Just for the record, every state legislator, here's the formula. If it's uh, someone identifying as male, it is ASM, last name. <laughs> or sen, last name, or if it's a female, ISW, last name, at njleg.org. Oh, that's the formula for email address, but all of these offices, they can be very helpful with those types of contacts. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, just really quick, any very quick last thoughts from our panel? All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, this was this was really great, and I, it seems like we made some good connections in the room, and I hope we keep doing that and exchange some information after.